so our next speaker um, is Dr. Alain Daguerre from the Montreal Neurological Institute and McGill. Uh, Dr. Daguerre originally trained in electrical engineering at McGill, and after obtaining a master's degree, he shifted to pursue medical studies at the University of Toronto. After obtaining his MD, he did internships in internal medicine, neurology, brain imaging, and movement disorders at Toronto, at Cornell, and in London, in England. He returned to Montreal in 1997 to join the faculty at the MNI, where he was a Killam Scholar and since 2013, a full professor. His work focuses understand, on understanding Parkinson's disease, as well as the neural mechanisms supporting motivated decision-making, addiction, and obesity both at the level of fundamental science and clinical applications. And he has become a world expert in these domains. But I actually know Alain first as a friend. You know, he was one of the first uh, people I met when I came to Montreal. And it was only later that I realized that he's this great scientist at McGill doing work on topics that overlap with my own interests. So we've been collaborating for many years now and have published a few papers together on MRI and EEG studies of perceptual decisions, mostly studies that he did in his lab. <clears throat> but today I think he's going to talk mostly on uh, some other lines of research uh, that he does, in particular, his work related to the insula's role in addiction and obesity. So, Alain, um, welcome, thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, okay. Very good. Good. So, I will uh, share my screen. So, okay, I assume you can all see the slides. Uh, so I will uh, talk about uh, some of our views on the uh, brain endophenotypes that make people vulnerable to obesity mostly. I won't talk as much about addiction here and try to relate them to the function not only of the insula, but of insular networks. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, students, postdocs, and uh, collaborators who uh, worked on this research that I'll present. So uh, now I don't necessarily believe that obesity is an addiction. I think there is obviously a, a relationship between drug addiction and obesity, both at the level of neuroscience and at the level of psychology. But um, be that as it may, it's interesting to look at the evolving conceptualization of, the, of addiction in the DSM, all the way from the DSM-3 to current. The early DSMs were more psychoanalytical, but with 1980, the DSM-3 defines addiction as uh, uh, two levels, dependence and abuse, and really requires pharmacological pharmacological effects. So dependence here is defined as tolerance and withdrawal. It's a purely neuropharmacological definition of addiction. Uh, in 1987, the first, for the first time, the idea of impaired control over drinking and preoccupation uh, appears. And then in DSM-4, we now have addiction with or without physiological dependence. So for the first time, you can be addicted with no tolerance or withdrawal. And then in the DSM-5, now there's really a central emphasis on brain reward systems and on reduced levels of self-control. Um, and for the first time, a non-drug addiction is mentioned, namely gambling. Now, even though I've said that this is all about addiction, the word addiction never appears in the DSM. And in fact, in the DSM-5, they specifically explain that they avoid using it. Uh, nonetheless, that's what they're talking about. Um, but so what we're seeing over the last 40 years is an evolution where we emphasize cognitive effects on addictive behavior and de-emphasize pharmacological effects. Uh, of course, if gambling can be an addiction, or if, as some people claim, uh, overeating can be an addiction, then possibly the pharmacological effects on neurotransmitter and receptor systems uh, are not crucial. Uh, so there are a lot of models of addiction out there. Some of the most famous ones, the incentive salience models by Barrage and Robinson, which is that drug cues instigate drug taking by acquiring incentive motivational properties through learning. And they emphasize the enhanced role of the dopamine system in this. Uh, the anhedonia hypothesis of 
mostly associated with George Koob, is that it's withdrawal or negative emotional states that drive drug taking. And he emphasizes reduced dopamine reward or function. I should say that these two are not mutually exclusive, although the, uh, the main protagonists do believe them to be completely uh, exclusive. Um, sometimes in entertaining ways at conferences. Um, and then there is the model proposed by Everett and Robbins, mostly of compulsive drug use, which occurs when there's a transition from voluntary to habitual drug use. And so they re refer to the transition from prefrontal control of drug seeking behavior to striatal or habitual control. But the model that uh, is perhaps less famous, but that many people in the imaging field uh, use, even if implicitly, is this uh, process model of emotional self-regulation, which has been uh, proposed for um, many emotional behaviors, not just addictive ones. But I guess Giuliani and Berkman are the ones who, who really applied it to drug addiction. And it's this idea that uh, craving is an affective state that occurs with exposure to cues. And the perceptuation, perception valuation action um, model, uh, I, will, I, I will show in this slide. So this is the, the process model. A cue appears, it's perceived, usually by the visual system, but also by the olfactory system in some cases. Um, a cue appears, it's perceived, it's computed in the visual stream. That information is passed forward to a valuation network, which is centered around the ventral medial prefrontal cortex and ventral striatum and dopamine systems. And then that information is passed on to action or motor areas, which lead to a response. And here, the decision to take the drug or to eat the tasty food is under the control of prefrontal and anterior cingulate areas. And they can uh, therefore exert control at two uh, control points. So with inhibitory control, the cue is valued, but the action is inhibited. And with value modulation, uh, the activity, the control point occurs earlier and the actual valuation of the cue is downgraded. So this model is interesting because it really allows you to do to have a whole brain approach. And I guess that's why it's popular in fMRI studies, because you can look at brain networks as being implicated in uh, decision making related to addiction. It also brings addiction into the realm of decision making and not just in, in the realm of simple uh, reward, motivation and craving. So. I like to show this painting by Raphael. It's, it's from uh, the National Gallery in London. It's the, called The Knight's Dream. And here, the knight has two paths open to him. Uh, on our left is the path of hard work, symbolized by the sword and the book and the severe clothes and the long winding road that leads to the castle and therefore to riches. And on the other side is the path of pleasure, of easy pleasure. And this idea that there are two systems, that there's a dual process in our minds, fighting for control of our behavior is extremely old. It's present in ancient philosophy and it's present in modern conceptualizations of addiction. And I would suggest that the reason it's so ubiquitous is that that is how it feels. Uh, for someone trying to quit smoking or trying to stay on a diet, it feels effortful to do so. And it feels like there's an internal conflict. Um, perhaps one of the most famous uh, um, systems that reflects this duality is, the, is Walter Mischel's dual systems theory, which he first uh, tested using the famous marshmallow test. I won't go into details about this. I think most people know about the marshmallow test. Uh, but it's interesting that uh, B.J. Casey and colleagues got some of these individuals. So they were tested when they were three and four year olds, but uh, they were able to contact them as adults and do an fMRI study on these 
kids who had uh, undergone the marshmallow test. And they separated them into the children who were able to delay their response to the marshmallow and those who weren't, so the so-called high and low delayers. And here they did a go-no-go -no -go task, a, stop, a, stop, a task where you have to inhibit a response. And they found uh, activation in this area in response to the no-go trials. And they also found that the amount of activation was greater in high delayers, people with presumably greater self-control than in the low delayers. Now, there's a few things that to me are implausible about this. Uh, I think these children were tested when they were three or four year olds. And it's hard to believe that these networks were already connected and functional at age three. But anyway, that's the finding. But I'm showing this for another reason. Uh, in the paper, in this PNAS paper, um, they refer to this area as the inferior frontal gyrus. And, you know, this is because there's a lot of literature on the inferior frontal gyrus as being uh, implicated, the, especially the right IFD implicated in stopping or inhibitory control. Um, but if you look at the peak here, it appears to be in the anterior insula. Now, uh, in fact, there are people who claim that the insula has no role in motivated choice, that its activation does not reflect the let's say the internal state of the individual level of hunger, for example. And who will say that when you, whenever you see activation here with fMRI, what you're really seeing is frontal operculum and not insula. However, if you take the peak of this study and look at it on the My and Paxinos Atlas, it, it is quite clearly in the insula. And then if you take this exact peak and put it into neurosynth, uh, you find that it does bring out the so-called salience network, the insular uh, or singular opercular or ACC insula network that is involved in salience. It is not uh, a value network or a DLPFC-based control network. So I would argue it's quite possible that this stop signal task finding um, relates to the anterior insula more than to the frontal lobe. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think is the trait that makes people vulnerable to overeating in our uh, obesogenic environment. Um, we all know that food intake and calorie intake is under homeostatic control. Um, however, it's clear that homeostasis cannot account for the increase in body weight that's occurred over the last 50 years in response to cheap palatable food. Um, Drunovsky has done a lot of work on this, and he suggests that 40% of the increase in weight in America can be attributed to reduced food prices. It may even be much higher than this, actually. There's also considerable evidence that processed foods are related to increased weight, and processed foods are processed so that they have greater caloric density. Uh, and again, this is much more explainable if you believe that food intake is under the control of high level executive systems, then under the control of pure homeostasis. Um, so one way to think about energy balance is that is under the control of something called allostasis, which is not just homeostasis. Homeostasis refers to a reaction to a, an error signal uh, allostatic eating would balance uh, needs, such as the current state of energy balance, and opportunities, such as the cost of food. And uh, this mechanism looks a lot like an economic diagram where needs and opportunities are balanced to arrive at a decision. So we've been interested in using neuroeconomics to try to understand obesity in the last uh, couple of years. And we've used this paradigm, which was first proposed by Antonio Rangel and Hilke Plasman. It's the Becker de Groot Marshak auction method. And here, uh, without going into details, you ask people to bid for the right to consume uh, food items. And the amount that they bid is a reflection of their desire or their wanting for the item. Um, 
And so you do this in the fMRI scanner and you can measure value. You can measure the actual in real time value of these items. And this is from the first paper by the Rangel and Plasman group. Um, you can see that they find this area, the ventromedial prefrontal cortex as reflecting value. So this is the bold activity that relates to the bid amount or willingness to pay for the different items. Uh, now, what's interesting though, in this paper, they're only showing this, but uh, they did not show all of, the, all of the data. When we use the same task, the exact same task, so people bid on all of these different food items, and we measure brain activity in response to willingness to pay, uh, so we do get these orbitofrontal and ventromedial prefrontal areas, but we also see activation in a whole host of other regions, including the nucleus accumbens, the bilateral insula, the anterior cingulate cortex. So what you're seeing is that the value computation of a food item involves not just the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, but really the entire salience network and the control network. They're all they're all basically coding uh, the value of the offered item. So what we've suggested is that there's actually an appetitive network uh, that is very close to the salience network um, of Seeley and Gracious, which involves the insula, amygdala, hippocampus, orbitofrontal and ventromedial prefrontal cortex and striatum which are heavily interconnected. And that activity in this network determines the choice uh, in response to the offered reward, the offered food cue. So amygdala hippocampus OFC would be involved in computing the value of the uh, reward item. But insula, which includes ingestive cortex, would, might be important in blending information about current incentive state, let's say how hungry you are, or energy balance state, with this motivational or value information. And then the striatum would be involved into changing all of this information into an action. And then higher level prefrontal ACC networks would be important for modulating activity <clears throat> within this network. <clears throat> so um, we did a few studies trying to look at the interaction between energy balance and decision-making. Uh, going now back to 2008, um, where we used a hormone called ghrelin uh, in subjects undergoing fMRI. So ghrelin is interesting because it's an appetite hormone. It's secreted by the stomach. It enters the brain or either via the vagus or via the bloodstream, eventually communicates with the brain to increase appetite. When you give ghrelin to people or animals, they become hungry and they eat more. And you can see that in a normal population, this is breakfast, lunch, and dinner, ghrelin peaks in anticipation of meal times. So, you know, before lunch, your ghrelin levels go up and that's why you get hungry at the time, at the normal uh, lunchtime. On the other hand, insulin and leptin are satiety or appetite decreasing hormones. You can see that insulin peaks after eating while uh, leptin tends to be low during the day and rise um, at night. The ghrelin is the only known uh, uh, appetite stimulating or orexigenic hormone. So we did one of these fMRI studies with food items and um, administered IV ghrelin or saline double-blinded to the subjects and uh, did fMRI. And what we found, so these are the ghrelin responsive areas. So these are the areas that change their activation um, in response to ghrelin. And you can see that this whole uh, appetitive network that I mentioned is responsive, including the amygdala, insula, orbital frontal cortex. Interestingly, also even visual, early visual areas are ghrelin responsive. This suggests that food cues acquire incentive salience in response to higher ghrelin levels. And indeed, we also found that ghrelin enhanced hunger and salience and even enhanced the memory for the food cues uh, at a later date. So uh, 
so again, this insular network appears to be responsive to an energy balance signal that increases appetite and hunger. Uh, and now uh, in the last few minutes or so, I want to talk about uh, the evidence that neurocognitive effects are important in uh, appetite control, so higher level effects. This is a study by uh, Uku Vainik, who was in my lab at the time, a postdoc, and um, it shows all the cognitive tests that are related to uh, BMI or adiposity. And in particular, it shows that tests of inhibition like the Stroop and the stop signal task are very often uh, related, correlated with body mass index. Uh, he also showed that uh, in a review, in this review, that personality was related to BMI, especially conscientiousness, which is a measure of top-down control or executive control, an ability to control one's actions in order to arrive at a goal. So we've come up with this sort of endophenotype approach to weight gain, where um, vulnerability to weight gain would be uh, this trait called uncontrolled eating. It's a tendency to overeat in certain situations. And it would be comprised of enhanced reward sensitivity and reduced self-regulation. Um, so both components of UE can be tested with questionnaires and laboratory tests. And both are related to brain endophenotypes, either with structural or functional MRI. Um, so we've done a few studies on this. Uh, Uku and um, Ashley Mason, Alyssa Eppel, and myself uh, have come up with this uncontrolled eating uh, scale, which is called the RED scale. And it's based on other questionnaires, other validated questionnaires. And um, we've showed that this, um, oh, sorry. We've shown that this, um, the score on this red scale is uh, related to BMI uh, in a very large undergraduate sample of over 2000 subjects. Um, and when you do a structural equation model to try to understand the various components of uncontrolled eating, you see that it's involved, that both lack of self-control and enhanced reward sensitivity are important. Another component is stress reactivity. So all three of these relate to uncontrolled eating. In other words, there's this trait, this, this phenotypic trait that people have that makes them vulnerable to uncontrolled eating and therefore to high BMI. Uh, and this goes back to that process uh, system, um, that model of perception, valuation, and action. People who score high uh, on this uncontrolled eating trait would have difficulty controlling this uh, flow of information to arrive at a particular desirable action, namely, you know, weight loss or stopping smoking. So when we did a meta-analysis of 21 fMRI studies, these are studies where people are shown appetizing foods and asked to consciously regulate their response to the food. So asked to do this basically, to control their, uh, their desire, desire for the foods while they're in the fMRI scanner. And what you can see is that in the regulate task minus baseline, there is activation of this uh, bilateral uh, PFC frontal, frontal opercular anterior insula ACC system. So this singular opercular network is activated when people attempt to regulate uh, their response to food cues. Uh, we also try to distinguish between the value modulation and the inhibitory control because the task by chance half, half had instructed volunteers to control their uh, desire and half to control their actions. Uh, and we tried here to, to differentiate the two, but what you can see is that in magenta, uh, 
the, uh, this right anterior insula frontal area is activated to both types of inhibitory controls. Um, and so, yeah, so since I don't have much time left, I will, uh, I will skip this particular task, this particular study, and go straight to uh, these final few words. Um, so uh, we were interested in um, seeing if we could find brain correlates of a uncontrolled eating trait. And this is with Ukuvenik again. We used the Human Connectome Project, which has 1,200 uh, young adults, healthy, and extensive brain imaging, personality, and cognitive testing. And we used this to look at the brain and cognitive correlates of obesity. Um, so the first thing we did, we looked for um, areas where cortical thickness correlated with BMI. And in blue, what uh, these are areas where uh, cortical thickness is enhanced with greater BMI. And in red are areas that are thinner uh, with higher BMI. And you can see one interesting finding is this clear asymmetry. And this, I should say, this study the, was first done in 900 subjects and then replicated in, in another 300 subjects from the Human Connectome Project. So this asymmetry is really interesting, this left-right asymmetry. Um, people have talked about this. There's evidence uh, that there is a left-right asymmetry in weight control. For example, from pe people who have stroke, uh, people who have stroke in the right front frontal area tend to gain weight, and people who have a stroke in the left frontal area tend to lose weight, For ex as an example. So, um, so our study sort of confirms this, but in particular, I want to draw your attention to this right inferior frontal gyrus insular area. So we see that when this area is thinner, BMI is higher. And this is very similar to that anterior insula, right anterior insula area that Casey found in the, in the uh, stop signal task in the, in the marshmallow cohort. It's uh, similar to that area that comes out in the self-control, uh, self-regulation studies that I just showed. So it's clearly an area that's involved functionally in the regulation of food intake. And here, what we're seeing is that this area, uh, you know, cortical thickness in this area in normal healthy individuals is related to BMI. Uh, we also, for your interest, uh, found certain cognitive and behavioral uh, correlates of BMI here. However, what we could do with the Human Connectome Project, we could also look for heritability because this uh, data set features siblings and twins, including mono and dizygotic twins, allowing you to compute heritability of various features. And in particular, we were able to compute the heritability of, well, of BMI. So the heritability of BMI was 75%, which is compatible, you know, completely consistent with the literature. But then when we looked at the heritability of the cognitive and personality features associated with BMI, they were also extremely heritable. So the cognitive profile that was related to BMI was also 75% heritable, which is consistent with the idea that genes that are involved in body mass index are mostly acting on the brain. But also what this suggests is that the genes that are related to BMI act on brain areas involved in cognitive control. We also found interestingly that the correlation between cognition, personality, and BMI was also heritable uh, up to 100%. So, um, so I went, this is a fast overview, but I think there is such a thing as an obesity endophenotype uh, that we refer to as uncontrolled eating. It can be identified by personality questionnaires and 
may be related to poor self-regulation. And I have provided some evidence that the uh, salience singular opercular network may be implicated in this uh, regulatory phenotype and may represent a trait. Um, although most of the literature on obesity focuses either on the hypothalamus and gut peptides or dopamine systems, such as the substantia nigra ventral striatum and maybe ventral medial prefrontal cortex, there is cons considerable evidence also that higher level cognitive systems centered around insula and frontal operculum are also implicated in uh, control of eating behavior. So we, you know, one possibility is that the rise in obesity that's occurred over the last 50 years is a response to food abundance, the abundance of cues and of processed food, and that there is an important role to play of a neurocognitive endophenotype in this rise in obesity with reduced executive control. Um, we've, I didn't talk much about this, but uh, we have uh, argued in the past that this enhanced consumption of food in response to plenty, to abundance, is actually optimal and um, is the result of evolution. Uh, and also that body weight defense is both under homeostatic and cognitive control. The defense against weight loss would be more homeostatic with hormones like ghrelin and leptin that I mentioned, but the defense against weight gain would be more the job of cognitive systems. And perhaps the insula salience network is important in this, in integrating the homeostatic and cognitive signals that lead to decision-making related to food intake. Thank you.